walks away after winning his 100th game as the head coach here at Notre Dame. The reason I was born with a silver spoon in my mouth, I was born in this country. It isn't what you have, it's what you're taught about the values of life. We're trying to save souls. Say so there's a real life, but then you're either growing or you're dying. And like an old friend once said, we as Americans need to start winning again. Everyone should ask this question. Am I willing to endure the pain and the suffering and the sacrifice it takes to be a champion? Welcome to another Lou Holtz podcast. The primary purpose of this podcast is to illustrate people that have got a second chance and took great advantage of it. Each and every week we have different stories. I don't know if we have any story more illustrating or more example of an individual who overcome adversity than we have with Duke started out in boxing. He was 19 to 0, and then he got arrested for selling drugs. President Trump pardoned him, and he's become a tremendous success. An individual that I admire and respect so much. So, ladies and gentlemen, before we do anything else, let's talk to Mr. Duke. How you doing? I'm doing great. How you doing today? I, I tell you, the way I like to say it, one step from suicide and two steps ahead of the posse, but... I'll tell you what, Duke, your story is really, truly amazing. Let's go back to when you first started. How did you get involved in boxing? How old were you when you started? Well, first and foremost, I'm always give my praise and glory to God and just, you know, thank him for being here today, you know, let alone being on this podcast with you. But um, to answer your question, I started boxing at the age of six years old. And um, I was following behind my father and my older brother, Lamont Dreams, is becoming the world champion. So um, it was a it was a beautiful calling for me. And I was using um, the the sweet science of boxing to, like, keep that fatherhood together that I was losing that um, from my dad based on different addictions. What was it about boxing that you really enjoyed? so much and kind of gave you the ability to excel in it because it's not an easy sport to perfect like i said that was that was my dad's dream to become a champion and then it triggered down to my older brother but they both had stopped boxing for their own personal reasons and you know my dad had got to abusing drugs and alcohol so i took boxing to make him come and be that father to me that I wanted and needed by me being the youngest of the other 10 kids. Well, you know, you're going along, you're 19 and 0. Uh, you got the world ahead of you. It looks like you're going to be a world champion. How did that happen, Duke? Well, you know, things wasn't going as planned as far as the money situations. And I was finna have a son and, you know, just life hit me and I took a shortcut. You know, coming from the streets of Geary, Indiana, um, I mean, I went to the streets and, 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 and I was, I started to sell drugs and make the money because like all my life, everybody had like jumped on my shoulders and back to take them out of not just, um, the poverty situations, but even the, the whole city and state. So it was just like all on me and the times wasn't moving as fast and, you know, I wanted to make some quick money to try to keep everybody afloat until that time came to I got my big shot. And and then um, I woke up then one day and I was being set up by the um, guy who was giving me the drugs. Um, so my boss ended up setting me up um, to shorten his sentence. I ended up going to trial because they wanted me to, you know, say some things and do some things that wasn't of my character and I just wanted to take responsibility for the laws that I had broken and I exercised my constitutional right to go to trial and ended up with two life sentences for a nonviolent drug crime. You know, one thing that I think is so important that impressed me about your story, Duke, is you maintained a relationship with your son. I think your son was two years old when you went into prison, is that correct? Yes, sir. Um, yes, and you know, and it's something I should tell all the other youngsters, and I tell even guys out here now, you know, that's 
you know, breaking the law or whatever, um, it's not an excuse for you to stop being a dad because you're getting punished for something, no matter what it is in life. Um, they gave us a pen, a pencil, a piece of paper. We was able to use the phone. We was able to have visits. Um, they put the computer system into it. So I used every tool, but the most important tool was the power of prayer that I prayed every day that me and my son would have a relationship. Well, Duke, when you got the sentence, two double lights, what went through your mind? And did you still have hope then? One of my favorite verses that comes out of um, Galatians 6, 9, and it tells us, you know, to um, let us not grow weary while we're doing good for them. In due season, we shall reap if we do not lose heart. So during that time, when I had got the time, my faith has grew strong in the word of God. And it was just like, you know, I knew what was coming um, and I knew what I had to do. So... I just, um, I continued to pray and, um, I asked God that whatever I had coming to me, give me the strength and power to endure it and not to give up and just, um, keep fighting. And I'm knowing that this sentence was unjust. So therefore it was gonna, um, be turned around. And I, and, and I believed that and I didn't waver in it. Well, did you ever get discouraged when it looked like, you know, President Obama would not pardon you? And then, lo and behold, who was expected President Trump to do so? What was that like in there? In in twenty like fourteen, if I'm not mistaken, they came along with a um with the Obama administration to help um a lot of men and women come home for for nonviolent drug crimes, and I fit all the prongs. I mean, I was a nonviolent. It was my first arrest. I had done immaculate things inside of the prison and um, I was overlooked and I was denied. And um, everybody was just like, even people that got it was more surprised that I didn't get it. But like I told them, like, um, I'm going to continue to pray. I'm going to continue to move forward. And I was laying in my bed. I, you know, I continued to write people. I continued to write other advocates. Um I continue to pray. Like I said, I continue to write the White House. And, you know, I'm laying in my bed October 21st for count. And the next thing you know, they was telling me, hey, you got to, um, we need to talk to you on the back. And then an hour later, I was in the hotel being freed by President Trump. Well, can you tell us about your journey from being a successful young boxer with a promising career to one involved in criminal activities? How in the world did you handle the ups and downs? You know, you look like you aren't going to get any freedom to double life, which was awful hard. What was your thought when they passed down that judgment? My thought on it was that, you know, this can't be real. This is just another test. It was hard. And based on being hard was that my parents both had suffered from strokes. And at that time, you know, they was begging me like, you know, when you they had to get separated. And that was one of the big things that hurt me and throughout the stay in prison. And, um, you know, I, I had angry moments. I had some moments to break, but, you know, that's where your faith come in at. And, and I was thinking, like, if I let go, I'm really letting them down. I'm already not there to support them like they need. And I lost my father first, and then I lost my mom afterwards. So, you know, it was really, like... You, you really can't give up now. You got this little boy, I mean, that's turning into a man. Because when I came home, he was 18 years old. Because I ended up doing over 16 years incarcerated on a double life sentence. So um, my spiritual and mental was on another level. And and the main thing was that um, this older guy told me, he said, you know, you got to fight. Even if it ain't for you now, even if it ain't even your faith no more, you got to fight for that little boy. He's doing too many good things out there. And he said that, you know, a real dad is always the son's first hero. So how you handle this situation can affect him just as well as the bad that you did. But how you handle this can change things. And, um, and I fought for it. And, um, by the grace of God, President Trump let me go, and I was sent home. What was your reaction when you got the double life prison? 
Oh, hey, listen, when I heard that he let me go, I was trying to cry, Coach, but they wouldn't come out. It was just like, you know what I mean? I just started sweating, and I was just sweating. So by the time I made it to the R&D, you know, the officers looking at me like, what's wrong? I had to change clothes, like literally like someone had pulled a bucket of water on me. Was there anybody in prison that encouraged you during this difficult time, Duke, or was it strictly your relationship with God? No, I think it was a number of things. Uh, I think it was family. I think it was uh, friends. I think it was even inmates as well. Um, and on top of it is just like, um, you know, the people that I didn't know, the people, the people that was fighting and the different advocates like yourself that was fighting for men and women like me and you guys didn't even know us. So... You guys was fighting for different policies and different rules to be changed to help us. That encouraged me even more because it's like, you know, the people that we don't even know is out here petitioning and fighting and trying to get these things done. And that's what made me stand even stronger and, and, and made me not want to give up. What, what, when you did get your opportunity, what was it like? What when they said there's a chance you might get the pardon. Not many people thought we'd come from President Trump because Barack Obama turned you down. But it's unbelievable how this all came about. And what was your son's reaction? Well, you know, like I said, within an hour of my release, I was sent to a hotel and my son was um, flew him and uh, um, Senator um out of Indiana named Eddie Milton that's now the mayor of Geary and Troy Bly. They was all met me at um at the airport with some of my family members as well that drove to to see me, um my god mom and god sister or whatnot. They drove to see me to take me to see him. So his thing was just like you hear now, you know, we're in the flesh. And someone recorded our um our union again, and we got over 6.1 million views from our hug and our embrace, and it came from President Trump. And, you know, it was kind of embarrassing because most of the, the the questions that people asked me, it was more so about, do I think he erases a dude? Or, or do, instead of asking me, how does it feel to be able to, to hug my son because of him? And, you know, I had to get a few people straight on that because I told them, you know, because of this right here, I'm able to be in a relationship with my son outside those prison walls. So this is a feeling that um, this closest, the best gift to me that I was given by giving me my salvation, I was given to it by President Trump. And it's a feeling that I, I can't even explain. And my son feel the same way. What's up, everybody? This is Charles Duke Tanner. Man, it's 30 days today. I've been free, man. I just get God all the praise and glory. And um, and I'm so thankful for President Trump, what he did for me. And um, yesterday, man, I got to go on my son's college campus. And, you know, we walked the whole campus. And, you know, we did an interview, a photo shoot, set by the pond. It's just opening the door about second chance, especially for fathers and, you know, freedom all the way around. I got so much new stuff coming. I got a vision and I'm not steering away from it. But what I need from all of you guys, man, just stay in prayer with me that I keep that vision and that I don't fall short of the glory. Just please give me that prayer. That's the only thing that I need. That's a, that's a wonderful story. How did you maintain that close relationship with your son? Because I met your son, beautiful young man. And, and, and so many people are around their sons and can't build a relationship with it, yet you built one for men prison. How did that come about? What were the reasons you were able to build a relationship with your son? Well, for one, I had to educate myself. Um, I took a program called the Life Connection Program and um, some fatherhood programs. And a lot of things that I read, it was about how men treat their kids when the cameras are, are off, or how a man treat their child in a in a in a rough and tough situation. So some of the elders that did help me and give me different advice was saying, you know, yeah, you in here for life, whatever. You might not go home, 
but that don't stop you from being your your son's hero. And um, so I wrote him. Um, I called him. You know, whenever I got a chance, we visit him. I think his mom, his mom always told him great stories about me and um, different people in the neighborhoods. And when he would meet someone, he would want to hear stories about his dad. And he's my best friend. He told me I was his hero, but I told him he's my hero. Uh, I just got married December 30th, and he was my best man. So with that being said, you know, it's it's just an honor to have him. He graduates college um, May 4th of this year. And it's just like, it's, it's you know, he did all of it on his own. And he said that um, that everybody said that I wasn't going to do this and I wasn't going to do that because you weren't here. And he said that just made me fight just as hard as you fought to get here to be successful. Well, that's, that's tremendous work. Were there times, did you ever get downhearted, discouraged, thinking, oh, this isn't going to work out, all these efforts are in vain? Yes, I, I got out a hundred times, a thousand times. Um, as, as a fighter, what she said, I wanted them to throw, I wanted to throw the towel in. I wanted to quit on the stool. I wanted to do whatever you can think about quitting. And even now, being outside is... It's still not easy. Um, I'm on supervised release because um, I didn't get the full pardon. I got the I got what you call clemency. Um, the president commuted my sentence. So um, with that being said, I still had supervised release, and they gave me ten years of it. And supervised release is really to get you back into the community, back into a relationship with your family. You know, um, no dirty urines and things like that. And they gave me 10 years of it. I have done three of it. And I actually just got denied last week to get an early termination. And, you know, to be honest, it it had me sitting back a little bit. But I was telling my son, I said, but I'm thankful in the situation. It's so much stuff to be thankful for in this situation because, look, I'm here. I get to hug you now. Um, I get to be at your college graduation. Duke, here's what I want to ask. Was there anything in your life that caused you to have this faith and keep going when everything seemed to be going against you? Yes, the the things that was done to other men and women in the Bible that I would read about, and I feel like if God did it for those people, what may, based on what Jesus said, I believe in, I feel he's going to do the same thing for me. Only thing we have to do is believe. And Joseph was one of my favorite characters because he did everything for his family. And if you notice at the end to where when his family thought he was going to get them back, and he didn't break the law to go through what he went through, but a lot of those things I went through, if you look at it, when the the people that he interpreted the dream for, they left the prison, they forgot about them. You know how many men left me in prison? Dude, I'm going to go out and petition for you. I'm going to go out and do this. Um, when I got denied by the Obama situation, main administration, it was just like, oh, man, you're never going to get it. But it was a time when that guy did remember Joseph. And when he remembered him, he remembered him in a way that he was able to not save just himself, but he saved the whole nation. So I looked at, at that and I would study that and I would believe that like, wow, I'm going to get out and I'm going to get out in a way that you guys don't understand. And the way that they try to make President Trump look, that's the guy that was used as the vessel to release me. And there was a beautiful thing. And he did it before the election five days before the election. I didn't get released on the second term when he was I had lost and was leaving out. I got released five days or six days, I think, before the election, which is really kind of unheard of. Most presidents don't even do clemencies or pardons before then. So that just shows his character. Do, do you still, to this day, maintain a close relationship with God? Yes, 100%. Um, I was actually down um, two days ago and I had to really read into my Bible and say, like, you know, the things that, like I said, I was, I am thankful for by getting denied on the um, 
on my supervised release because, you know, it's okay, but it's still, you know, like my son, an hour, 40 minutes, I have to get approval just to go see him at his school. You know, that's kind of like heartbreaking when we're in the same state. Like if I just want to go watch him practice or take him to dinner, I have to get it approved. Oh, my. Well, that's amazing. Well, when you look back on it, what would you change differently now? Oh, I wouldn't have broke the law. I wouldn't have tried to break the law. I would have tried to continue my boxing career um, because I feel like where I thought I was helping so many people, I really hurt the ones that needed me and loved, and loved me the most, you know, going through that time or whatnot. But to be honest, I try to not look back at that part. I just try to use everything that, I went through to help someone else not go through it, if that makes any sense, as well as try to teach these young men how to be a father, even if it's not even your child, because, you know, someone still got to lead the men, you know, and there's so many men out here that don't have fathers and was brought up without fathers, and they need that guidance. They need that teaching. They need a man to embrace you and tell you he's proud of you or he loves you. Reflecting on your journey, what advice would you offer to young people who have faced many challenges and obstacles? That's the one thing about it, Duke. We all have challenges, we all have obstacles, we all have difficulties, and things don't always work out. In your case, it did, but that's not always. Right. Well, first and foremost, I would hope they have a father figure if they didn't. I would hope that it's some type of program or some type of uncle or brother or even guy off his off in the neighborhood that can ment mentor him and guide him to get a relationship with God. And if they ain't even made it to that step, you know, like try not to take the shortcuts because the shortcuts always make it make you get there faster, but it don't make you pick up all the tools and the things that's necessary on the journey to get to the finish line. So I would rather you finish the right way instead of cheating, because at the end of the day, you might cheat someone that really needs your help. So that would be my advice. And also it would be to, um, to ask questions, to ask for that mentorship and try to get it because, you know, it's guys like myself that have been around things that, Maybe I can help, but you can still give me so much knowledge. And every time I see you, you always do. So um, I just think we have to keep pushing it down to what that iron sharper iron um, attitude. Well, when you consider this, that uh, you're in prison there for so long, did you continue to box when you were in prison? No, because, because of my record and because of... Um, the set skill that I had, I was um I was watched closely for that. And if I did any type of teaching or boxing exercises, I could get punished for it and I would lose different rights to like um, you know, the the telephone or commissary or visits. So I could not do it at all. And if I got caught um even trying to do it even in my cell, I can get um disciplined for it. Oh, why? To have so I lost my car. Boy, that takes yeah. something away that was so important to you it had to have been hard on you. That was one of the things that hurt me besides my son and my parents. You know, the other thing was the true love that I had for boxing. You know, um, I had been doing it since I was six years old. That's all I knew. But, you know, I looked at it. It, it was my fault. Um, I took the shortcut, so I had to wear it. And like I tell a lot of people that um, parents out there to use me as an example, because it's a win win situation. If you tell your son or daughter, say, hey, listen, this guy, Duke Tanner, had all the tools to become a world champion and to become a successful person. And he chose not to do not be like that and waste your talent. But you could also that same parent could also tell the same child. Like, listen, this guy had talent. He messed up, but he accepted his responsibility. He got his punishment, and he came out a better person. And that's what life is about. It's about the choice you, the choices that you make. 
So he had a second chance. And I think we all deserve more than a second chance because, to be honest, I really I don't even recall having the first chance. I'm really trying to see where my son, is he going to go back to grad school or is he going to start working? And I'm just moving forward. I'm married now, so I'm not looking back and trying to hold things back. I'm just moving forward and taking them and trying to be a part of anything I can do to help this next generation to save it. And, and, and a lot of my opinions matter, I think. So that's why I'll be on the ground with those, those youngsters. They, they are really my, um, they are my everyday core. The men under 25 years old, like I'm really in tune with them. I like, I pull up in different neighborhoods and just talk to them sometime. And, you know, some of them listen and some of them don't, but you know, if we say one, we say the multitude, right? Duke, tell us about your new wife and how that came about and the obstacles you had uh, courting her through prison. Well, actually, um, I had met her when I, first, when I came home. And, um, you know, I had told her, I said, you know, if I see you again, you got to remember this smile because this is a real good smile. I knew what time it was from day one. I saw you that day at the rooftop. I told you, look at this smile. I don't want you to remember the day. You're going to see me again. So if I see you again, then you got to take me on the date. So I ended up seeing her again, and we started to date. And, um, you know, it was kind of a love at first sight thing. You know, she had been through a lot of different struggles and she was able to um, understand me, the real me, not even covered up. And it it just led to us trusting each other and sharing deep secrets with one another about that, that you know, some that we never share with no one. And I believe that our struggle has made our, that is what made our union on top of the love that she has for her daughters and the love I got for my son, so our parenthood. And it led to a, a union that I feel that's going to that's gonna go down in the history books because it's like, you know, when you see us, you see love. You you, you see the respect. You see everything that you need um, in the family and then in the backbone. And she supports me 100% in what I do and everything I do. So, like, she just had sent me a message and told me to uh, make sure – that she said a prayer and that uh, God give me the strength to do this podcast this morning. Well, Duke, it's an amazing, amazing story. What is the most important thing you've learned through all this? Don't try to do everything yourself on your own will. Um, you know, my dad was militant, the militant attitude to where I couldn't cry. I couldn't do certain things. And, you know, he was he was tough love and 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 I believe in in love. So I did the opposite of what I was taught. Like, you know, I didn't really get a lot of hugs and kisses when I was coming up as a kid. So it's like, you know, you gotta take the good you gotta take everything in life and then, you know, wash out the stuff that you don't need. And then try to put the good things together because, you know, we are here for each other. And I think that's a part of what's going to make this world a better place to where we put our good deeds out there instead of our, just our bad deeds. I have a lot of bad deeds probably, and I try to, you know, push them away. But I try to move off love and, and respect. That's and, and, and I don't want to lie, I learned a lot of that in prison. The word respect and, and the love that you give gets you a long way. Your character as a person gets you the long way. Were, were you ever tempted for self-pity, bitterness, with all this going on when it didn't look like it was ever going to come to a positive end? No, I never, I never, I'm not, that's not my character. Um, I never had a pity party. Even right now, like I said, you know, things didn't go right. You know, um, I won't lie, I came home to the money I had on my account. Um, you know, I, I mean, I've been working and doing everything I can since 
all my life, you know, so um, I never did the pity party thing. Um, my anger, I try to hold that to myself, and that's what I was just explaining. So when I'm feeling like that, that's when I really try to show love to people to take it away because me being angered might lead me into having a bad bad decision. Like I said, being in prison and the maximum security, you know, you have to live off respect and you have to put your emotions to, to the side because even though I was a fighter and I can defend myself, it was a lot of other guys that have nothing to lose. I was housed with the worst prisoners in the world because we had the worst prisoners in the world in the federal maximum security prison. So what they cared about taking another person's life wasn't nothing. So, you know, um, I was able to put all that stuff in check and was able to be humble and be respected off of my character and the love that I showed to people. Well, that, that's amazing. You're an incredible individual. Duke, I've known you for a couple of years, and your story just never ceases to amaze me. And what a great inspiration you are. And to turn out to be such an excellent father while you were in prison, that goes above and beyond the call of duty. So could not be any happier that you joined us, could not be any happier that you've embraced this society, and so pleased that you've been able to overcome adversity and the future looks great for you. I thank you so much. And uh, my my like my son always tell me, you know, he always looking for you. And because when we was just in Florida, you was able to let us be able to get the pictures with, with the president. And that was something that he would never forget. And um, he said, we got to thank him at the same time, Pops, for him letting you out. Anything else you want to share with us, Duke? I just want to thank you guys for um, not looking at me or looking down on me. And this is the prime example of what redemption is about and what second chance is about. And it, and it should give hope to America to see that, you know, you do got the people that's behind the scenes that help people that they don't even know. And my story and many other stories need to be heard. And I want to be the one to speak for the people that don't have the voice because like who on earth would think that Duke Tanner is on a podcast with the famous Coach Lou host. And we're sharing our love stories to each other and just the respect that we have for one another. That right there shows that, this ain't fake. It's real. You know, you still remember my son. You, that's the first thing you ask about whenever you see me. So it's like, it's serious and people need to understand it's many more doing the same thing behind the scenes. And I just thank you. And I thank, um, FBI. And I just want everybody to continue to follow us and, and, and stay on board with us because we, we're trying to make the changes that the world that the world need, not just America. I, I tell you what, Duke, you're such an inspiration that you've overcome so much adversity and difficulty. Can't thank you enough for joining us. I'm just sorry I'm not a professional at this that I couldn't ask you more better questions. You are an inspiration to thousands, including me. So I look forward to maintaining a long relationship with you, Duke. Congratulations. God bless. God bless. Thank you, Coach. That concludes another insightful episode of the Lou Holtz podcast. We'd like to extend a heartfelt thank you to our incredible guest, Duke Tanner, for joining us today and sharing such valuable perspectives. To all our listeners, thank you for tuning in and being part of our community. If you enjoyed today's episode, we encourage you to visit our website, theloholtzpodcast.com, for more information and resources related to this episode. If you love the Lou Holtz podcast, please take a moment to leave us a comment and give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. Your support helps us reach more patriots like you, and we truly appreciate it. We also want to give a special thanks to our executive producer, Alexandra Campana, and the entire team at the Lou Holtz podcast for their hard work and dedication. Remember, new episodes are available every two weeks, so make sure to subscribe and stay tuned for more inspiring conversations. Until next time, stay strong, stay proud, and God bless America.